Okay, so um, again, thank you for being with us and taking the time. Oh, uh, my pleasure. This conversation, uh, ongoing conversation. Um, you know, so so everybody know this is the uh, uh, today marks the fifth anniversary of the transition of uh, President Hugo Chavez. Um, so it's one of the days, one of the reasons why we wanted to do it today. You know, um, uh, Monday is often an odd day for us to do things as we know, but uh, uh, we thought it was significant to do uh, this day and to, to be in some solidarity uh, and to learn more about uh, what's happening in Venezuela uh, now. Uh, we know uh, from uh, particularly reading the New York Times and some other things that there's a cheerleading squad here in the United States um, you know, seeking um, regime change uh, in Venezuela uh, actively. And uh, Secretary of State uh, Tillerson uh, is actively orchestrating a campaign uh, against Venezuela uh, as we speak, uh, particularly seems to be coordinated. And, and, and Ambassador Ron will give us more details on that. but. Uh, it seems to be a high level of coordination at this point in time with Brazil. Uh, and we know about the coup government in Brazil and how that got orchestrated uh, to be able to make a move like this possible. Uh, and then uh, the, the government of uh, Colombia, which um, unfortunately has had a string of uh, right wing governments for as long as we, uh, uh, fortunately, long as we can remember. Um, uh, but there also seems to be another level of coordination with uh, Mexico uh, right. as well. So they're gathering, uh, you know, their forces. Um, uh, and uh, from from at least my own personal perspective, we need to uh, gather ours, do a broader uh, level of, of outreach and education in the United States so folks have some clear and direct information of what's going on in the, on the ground. Uh, so we can kind of counter a lot of this propaganda that's being put out there, uh, you know, against uh, Venezuela and the Bolivarian process and revolution. So uh, with that, I just want to, you know, um, uh, basically turn it over to, to you, Carlos, and, um, you know, we'll go maybe uh, 20, 25 minutes and then just open it up for questions. Would that work? Sounds good. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for the opportunity. Um, you know, it's great to to be here. Um, let me know if you could hear me. Okay. Hold on just a second. We, the right. same technical problem yeah, seems to be. On the laptop, you guys. Yeah, can hold on one second, bro. All right. You got to. Um, because it was. How you get out of that and just. Please escape, please escape. Yeah. That's for pictures. No. Let's push it back. Capping the screen and then hit escape to get out of the poster. Tap the screen. Yeah. Click on the screen one time. No, click on the screen. Window. Okay, yeah, right. let me um, go to preferences. System preferences. It's coming. It should be coming. It's coming. You gotta let it go. Your computer. My computer. Hey, you want it? Hold on just a second. Um, no problem. Okay, you can see you, Jay. Uh, they, 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 were, they were asking everybody to come into this tonight. Is the message that she sent out. Okay, it should work now. No, it's still, I can still hear it on my... It's still coming from these speakers. It has no output controls. 
Yeah, I don't know. Here's a second, Carlos. Hold on a second. No problem. Just align with the... All right, try it now. All right, can you hear me now? No. No. Um, it gives all my speakers. I don't know why. Uh, how did you project it, Jossie? Maybe that's what we need to do. I used that the last time, but it's just where the speakers are. We thought we had this problem figured out a second ago, and that's why we, we kind of held up. And something about my computer is not connecting with our TV uh, sound system. Um, so we're trying to work because otherwise it's going to be hard for people to hear you. Okay. What if you plug the speakers to your computer? That's what somebody went to grab a set of speakers uh, to, to, so we can try to amplify it. Okay, try it now, Carlos. All right. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Me, there you go. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's a um, great pleasure for me um, to be able to talk to you. I, I, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. It was uh, I had a last minute uh, delegation to tend to, and 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 I couldn't uh, leave Washington. Um, but I hope that I could get down to uh, Jackson um, very soon. Um, it was something I've been wanting to do for a while now. Um, so, all right. So let me get right right into into business. Um, I think that. Um, it's always I always say it's hard to talk about Venezuela and about the um, the Bolivarian Revolution in general because by now it's been you know 18 years and there's so many things, so many steps, so many uh, events that we have to to discuss and and um, it's always hard to kind of sum it up in five minutes or ten minutes. Um, so I think that uh, in general terms, I as you know, it's it's a national liberation process. Um, you know, something that, uh, among other things, um, gave us the right to participate, to have a, a democracy that is ours, where we are the main, you know, players of, of, of our democracy, not just uh, a ritual of going to vote and, 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 and uh, you know, every, every four years or whatever, and, and, and that's it, but actually a democracy where we have access to making laws to making profound changes in the way our society works, um, a democracy where people are actually asked what they think the way should be uh, via referendum, via elections. By now, 
I, I said we, we're 18 years into um, the revolution, and we've already had uh, 24 national elections in that period of time. Um, and there's been other uh, important things that, that, that I know you, you, you must know or have heard of because you, you, you followed uh, uh, the Velocity process somewhat. But I think in general terms that um, we, could pick, we could pick four pillars that, that I would say are, 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 have been very important in um, building what the Venezuelan revolution is now. And those four pillars are the, you know, things, the, the, the most important transformations, at least in my view, that we have undergone in the last 18 years. Um, one being uh, democratization of media access. Um, you know, we began by understanding or, or, or bringing up the issue of what the media, the mainstream media, uh, or media in general, should, what, what its role was. Um, in, in, um, in the corporate world, it's understood as a private entity that has all these rights to, uh, to basically sell their product, which is the news that, that, that they offer. Um, but in reality, what we see it is as a public service. That's what, at least what it should be. That's the purpose of, 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 of media is a public service so that information can be uh, given out. Um, so there was a process, a profound process of democratization um, of the media through a series of laws that, that, that sort of helped open the space. It, it, it brought into question why uh, certain media groups had uh, long time concessions, I mean, 20 year concessions, why there were monopolies. Um, and, by, and by bringing these questions down, uh, we realized that we needed to open space for community media, for independent, uh, other independent enterprises that were not corporate, um, state media that would actually, you know, uh, have the community's uh, um, interest at hand. And that process led to a confrontation between a government that's promoting this democratization and a group of media conglomerates that are resisting. So, I, and, I, and I start with that because that's why it's, it's so hard for you to hear a narrative on Venezuela right now that makes any sense. Because what you hear right now from the mainstream media in Venezuela is what gets reproduced in mainstream media in the United States. And basically you're hearing about a country who's on the, you know, on the edge of collapse, uh, who, you know, a country that, that uh, it's, it's worse than any, any war that you can imagine. Uh, that the situation is uh, so terrible because of its government and that the United States or the international community has to somehow intervene now and, 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 um, and do something about it. So um, that would, I don't think any of this would have happened had we not at the beginning of the revolution started thinking about questioning the power of the mainstream media. I'll go back into all the other issues uh, a little later. Um, but the other, another pillar that I think is very important and that also uh, helps shed light to what's going on is that the revolution in these 18 years started to assert Venezuelan sovereignty over its own resources, particularly the resource of oil, which is our main uh, production. And we have the largest oil reserves in the world. Um, and of course, when, when you start asserting uh, Sovereignty is is that only not only do you uh, does that mean that you're negotiating with uh, in in different terms with these uh, large co corporations and saying you know you you really should let a fair cut go to the Venezuelan people and you know redefine how how uh, the, the division is, but also um, you are hurting uh, the prospects of. Uh, the Venezuelan elite who didn't for a long time didn't really live off any productive venture but rather making money out of oil of the oil income um, there they were basically being subsidized by uh, previous governments rather than that go that money going into public uh, investment what we've done 
is to use the revenues from oil and redistribute it among the people via education, housing, um, uh, health, and in a way that we sort of, you know, try to pay back the debt that uh, the country had with the majority of its excluded citizens. A third thing, which is very important for us, was uh, has been regional integration, a strengthening the bonds between other Latin American countries, uh, designing a way of relating with one another that would be based not on commerce, not on also you something, you sell me something back, but rather, what do you have? What do I have? How can we help each other? How can we strengthen each other by complementing each other? Um, and throughout these last 15 years or so, alternative ways of, of interacting with each other, alternative ways of uh, integrating have developed. Regional blocks, no longer depending on the United States as used to be uh, before, but actually a conversation within ourselves. That's something that's also, that has also been under attack in the last four years. And finally, obviously, I think what, is, what I mentioned before, the most important element is that the, the, the way we conceive democracy is participatory and is one where we call protagonistic because we feel that you know the protagonist of this whole story is the every, your everyday citizen. No transformation can come if the citizen doesn't decide that this that that he or she is part of um, their own transformation. I laid this out because those I think those are the four strong pillars on which the Bolivarian Revolution. Um, has been successful, and those are precisely the four reasons why it's being attacked so hard. In the last year, um, after President Trump came to power, granted that we didn't, ha we haven't had a good relationship with the United States for, uh, for, you know, before that. I mean, with during the Bush administration, we were uh, constantly harassed to the point that in 2002, there was backing from the Bush administration to the coup. Uh, the attempted coup against President Chavez during the Obama administration, where things seemed that they could be moving towards a better understanding or at least a, 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 a type of dialogue. At the end of the day, we were sanctioned for the first time, not for the first time, but we were sanctioned um, with the strongest sanction up to date which was declaring Venezuela an unusual, extraordinary threat to the national security and foreign policy of the United States. And when you look back in history, the countries that have been declared such a threat, for example, Nicaragua in the, in the 80s or uh, other countries in the Middle East, the result has been large intervention, in some cases, military intervention. So. All of a sudden, you know, it, it's an upside down world where, you know, Venezuela, who has no nuclear weapons, has never invaded any other country, is now a threat to the largest military power in the world. Obviously, nobody believes that. They don't believe that. But a couple of days ago, President Trump renewed this executive order saying that we're a threat. And during his government, I think uh, it was not only a comeback from the hawks of the Bush administration era, but it's also, you know, there's also factors uh, that, are, that are locally based, um, especially when you see that most of the initiatives, whether it be in Congress or otherwise, against Venezuela come from the state of Florida from senators from Florida, from uh, representatives from Florida, who have made their political lives basically upon the issue of Cuba, of, of battling against Cuba. And now that there's there was an opening during the last years of the Obama administration towards Cuba, easing of some restrictions, reestablishing of uh, embassies, um, now you have a generation of Cuban Americans that oppose the embargo that would rather go and invest or, you know, have a, a, a different type of relationship 
with uh, Cuba, they saw their own existence uh, threatened by that and that they needed some other basis for which to, you know, base their politics. And they looked at the Venezuelan community where you more or less have about 100,000 new Venezuelan Americans uh, in Florida that have voting power and they are trying to make themselves into a new political class with voting power in that region. And that is important because you, you don't see, you don't really see any initiatives against Venezuela coming from anywhere else. That's where it's all based. But at the same time, uh, we've fallen into, uh, um, I don't know how to say this, but, but we, we're falling into um, a place where many of the usual threats or maybe uh, problems, let's say it that way, that the U.S. administration uh, has around the world somehow end up being connected to Venezuela. And I'll give you an example to, to make myself clear. Uh, the Cuba issue, for example. Um, so there's political differences with Cuba. And then since Venezuela has a friendly relationship with Cuba, has a, a, a strong relationship of cooperation with Cuba, then Venezuela must be doing something wrong. And then you know, we should act against Venezuela. Or you have the issue of Iran or Palestine, because Venezuela backs, uh, you know, has supported the the Palestinian state, has supported uh, the Palestinians against uh, the abuse of the Israeli government, has broken relationships with Israel, then Venezuela becomes a problem uh, in the United States um, for those that you know support Israel. Or if you have the issue with Iran, Venezuela has a friendly relationship with Iran, you see that people are willing to talk to Iran or even, you know, uh, work a deal. However, Venezuela is a problem because Venezuela has a good relationship with Iran. When you talk about China, you know, we first turned to a stronger cooperation with China when in 2006, we began being sanctioned by the United States. We realized that we couldn't depend solely on the United States because we need, you know, because this could happen again, this could get worse. And we need to diversify our relationships. So we went and looked for other partners. And there was Russia, and there was China, and there was other Latin American countries like Brazil at the time, and many others. But now that this administration, for example, feels that the U.S. hegemony is somehow being threatened by the expansion of Chinese presence in Latin America, who do they hit? Venezuela, because of the relationship that it has with China. Or if the Democrats on the other side want to attack the Trump administration because of the supposed collusion with the Russians, and then they hear that Venezuela has some, has had, again, like I said before, some working relationship with Russia. Then they hit on Venezuela as well. So by the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we somehow we're touched by all these other issues that are not directly the Venezuelan issues, but that somehow affect us. And that policy, U.S. policy is being, uh, you know, uh, it's, what, it's, what U.S. policy is trying to promote is to eliminate the Venezuelan government that is having all these relationships with other uh, countries and, and that somehow question um, U.S. Uh, authority or, or plans, so to speak. From, that is not to say we haven't been uh, facing problems of our own. And you have to understand that uh, like I said before, we, we, we are oil dependent economy. And that's not something that you can change in 18 years. That's not something, you know, that we, we've been an oil dependent economy for 100 years now. And the problem there is that uh, when prices are high, things are well. We could do a lot of things. When prices are low, we have to, you know, we come into, into some problems. 
when prices were high in the past, before the Bolivarian Revolution, before President Chavez, um, the money stayed within the company. The money went to uh, the richer sectors of society. When President Chavez came into power, the money, when the oil price was high, was invested into social programs, like we mentioned before. And the priority during all these years was to invest in social programs. A second priority that we never got to fully develop was developing alternative method of production that we could, you know, uh, that we could make our economy sustainable. And because of that, now that the prices are low, we still haven't had enough time to build an alternative. But the United States sees that sees that opportunity or sees that 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 framework as an opportunity to beat on the Venezuelan government to try to uh, promote uh, strife within the Venezuelan population and blame it on the government together with the Venezuelan elite that has for 18 years lost every election or at least uh, almost all elections because they have no platform that people would buy into. They have no way of convincing people that, that privatization is good. They have no way of convincing people that they should cut back social programs. They have no way of running an election and, and telling people their true intentions because the people, you know, want something different. And the people, the people now know that they, they deserve something different. So what has been happening during the last three or in the last four years, but specifically has been accentuated, exacerbated um, during the last year, is that some sort of economic war against Venezuela, which on one hand is driven by the local elites who wants to promote this strife, to want to get people tired because of the, you know, uh, uh, um, the hardships that they could be facing. And on the other hand, by the United States bringing in sanctions. We have been sanctioned in a way that we cannot renegotiate our debts. So other countries around the world, you know, they, they do things to try to alleviate their, you know, the, the their problems by renegotiating what they need to pay, by issuing bonds, by, by doing a, a whole set of, you know, there's a whole set of tools that they could use. And most of those run through U.S. banks. So the sanctions that we have been imposed now are that we cannot use any of these tools. Another sanction that we have, we own Citgo, the Venezuelan uh, oil, national oil company, PDVSA, is the largest stakeholder or the sole stakeholder, I should say, of Citgo in the U.S. Now, what used to happen was that Citgo's profits would go back to Venezuela, and that money would be basically used for buying, you know, things we need for infrastructure, medicine, food, whatever. Since the sanctions in August, we can no longer use the revenues from Citgo to purchase any of these things. And then you hear in the media how Venezuela, how the Venezuelan government is being blamed for not having access to food, for not having access to, for the people not having access to food, for medicine, but nobody's telling you that we have the money in the banks that we want, or that we have the money in Citgo that we want to buy and purchase these things, and that we're not being allowed by the, because of the sanctions. Because of the sanctions also tell the banks, don't let your money run through, you know, don't, don't let the Venezuelan money run through your systems. Right now, we have about $2.5 billion stuck in U.S. banks or in banks around the world and we can't get them out to buy the things that we need for our people. If that's not convincing enough, um, during the past month of February, Secretary Tillerson went, uh, did a tour throughout Latin America, and he was asked about President Maduro, about uh, his, how he felt about if, if President Maduro uh, should be in office or not. So he said something like, well, you know, President Maduro, the best thing would be for him to leave on his own. And then, if not, and I quote, 
oftentimes it is the military that handles that. They will manage a peaceful transition. Two days later, Senator Rubio comes out with a tweet saying, and I quote, the world would support the armed forces in Venezuela if they decide to protect the people and restore democracy by removing a dictator, referring to a constitutionally democratically elected government of you know, President Maduro. A couple of days after that, the United States uh, Southern Command Chief comes into Colombia to talk with Colombian Armed Forces. And a couple of days later, 3,000 Colombian troops move to the border near Venezuela. Two days later, troops from Brazil move to the border, to the other border with Venezuela. At the end of the day, what you see, we're being surrounded, we're being attacked by an elite that has, that has never, that internally that has not been able to convince the people to vote for them, by sanctions coming from the United States, by regional actors from the right wing who, for example, overthrew, like Kelly was saying, overthrew the Brazilian government, the popular Brazilian government of the Workers' Party, and whose president has not been elected. He was appointed president um, after he after they impeached uh, 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 Dilma Rousseff in, in, in a parliamentary coup. And and he couldn't even be president if he wanted to because he 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 is under uh, administrative. He, he was at one point condemned uh, of of. Um, um, misuse of uh, public funds or something to that effect, to the fact that he could he can't even run if he wanted to. You have a Santos in Colombia who has been known for a brutal campaign against um, the Colombian peasantry, always being justified as a war against the guerrilla insurgency, but even now after the FARC have signed an agreement, you see that over 200 leaders have been murdered after the peace was signed. You see all these countries in the region moving towards the right wing, and they, they also have an interest in getting Venez the Venezuelan government out of office because at the end of the day they say, well, without the Venezuelan inspiration or the Venezuelan example or the Venezuelan presence, we could get rid of our own internal popular movements. That's where in the, that's in the, in the position we're now. We're surrounded by internal enemies, we're surrounded by regional enemies, we're surrounded by sanctions from the United States. They argued that Venezuela is a dictatorship, but in the last year, or in the last seven months, Venezuela has had three national elections. One for a constituent assembly where for the first time we included specific sectors of society that had never been included before, such as fishermen, people with disabilities, um, workers, organized workers, to draft an up, or actually to update the constitution. We had elections for governors where the opposition won. And because they wanted to sabotage the, the, the results, they told their candidates, the, the candidates that won, not to allow themselves to be sworn in. The candidates obviously said, you know, wait a minute, but we won. So, yeah, but you can't because that will be legitimizing the government. So, well, uh, but we we won. We should still be, you know, uh, we should still be able to to take our, our our positions. And the opposition parties ended up expelling their winning candidates just because what they wanted to do was delegitimize the elections. At the end of the day, we're going to have elections again in May for president, according the way you know our constitution has stated, and the mainstream media 
and what you hear from officials here is that Venezuela is a dictatorship, that, the Venezuela, that Venezuela doesn't want to uh, uh, run election. But, but, in the, but what really is happening is the complete opposite. We come out to you, and we, you know, we, and we, we like to talk to you because uh, um, it's important that the people know what's really going on in Venezuela, and it's important that people can can look beyond the mainstream narrative and see that what we have is a, a, a an emancipation process um, from the grassroots in Venezuela that's being attacked by all the special interests around us, regional, national and you know at the level of the united states what we want to do is to let people know that we need solidarity and we need support and we want to share what we've learned what our experiences have been with you as well because we think it's important to have a strong relationship with our brothers and sisters here in the united states but we have to overcome this constant attack that we have um, I'll leave it up to the, there because I know there's probably a lot of things, but and then you know, but but it could definitely uh, op we're definitely open to um, any specific questions that you have or anything else that you you wish you know that I, that I could talk to you about. All right, thank you, Carlos. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. Um, Want to open it up now for what? Do have a question? Uh, Chucho, <laughs> Chucho made it. <laughs> I saw, he was sneaking out the back. I saw him. <laughs> uh, why no medicine? Why no food in Venezuela? And so we got a question: Why no medicine? Why no food in Venezuela? Okay, so so there's there's different um, look. There's different elements there. Um, it's not it's not necessarily true that there is. I mean, or or, or let, let's say it this way. It's not true that there isn't any. Um, there are things that are being found, but but there, there, there's there's been problems of selective scarcity that have been promoted by the distribution different distribution chains. By most of the distribution is in is in private hands, and and because of that, you have you have had sabotages. That when you look at when these products are in, in high levels of scarcity, and sometimes it's only specific products, um, it's usually around election time, it's usually around when there's going to be an important political moment in the country, and it's motivated, it, it, it's done with political purposes. At the same time, there's another issue that I've just discussed before. Being sanctioned right now, being not being able to bring some of the things that we sh that we need is a big problem if the sanctions were lifted if we were able to buy with the resources that we have the food and the medicine that we need in the quantities that we need we you know we could deal with that problem you have to understand that venezuela has subsidized a lot of you know ma basic food products and has subsidized uh basic medicine to the point that that has led to also to uh, extraction at the borders with Colombia and Brazil, but mostly with Colombia. If you buy something that is on, on a regular regulated price in Venezuela, let's say corn flour, you could easily go to the border in Colombia and sell that for another for, you know, in, in an international not subsidized price and make a profit. So that began to be a problem, and that, that led to many basic products being taken out of the country and being sold outside. One of the things that the government is doing to try to alleviate that and correct that is reduce the subsidies to the direct products and rather subsidize directly the people through the Carnet de la Patria, which is a, the card, is rough translation of the, you know, the homeland card, basically is something that was issued to citizens, families, and that would be giving direct subsidies to those families that are in need. However, because of the sabotage that we have been undergoing,
there is a high amount of inflation that makes it difficult for people to buy, you know, the things they want because you know there is a problem with with you know a difficulty to buying it with the inflation. But that's those things are trying to be corrected, and at least the most basic products are trying to be given out to the people through local community organizations who have who have been the ones that receive government imports you kind of skip the distribution line from from uh from the private sector receive the government imports and have been able to um uh, hand them over to at a low very low cost uh to the families in need by now the, the that program which is called clap which is local committees of uh uh, food and and and, and uh, production have been able to distribute uh, monthly uh, um, basic products to six million families in the country. So there are problems; they are being magnified in some sense um, by the media because there's a need to construct this, you know, idea, this narrative that Venezuela is in the middle of a crisis that needs foreign intervention. But at the same time. You know, uh, there are things, there are measures trying to, you know, uh, put into place that clash with the sanctions that the United States is, play, is, is currently imposing on Venezuela. Okay, why no cash in Venezuela? Why no cash in the bank? You go to the bank and you can take all your money that you want. No cash? Why? Did you hear the, the question, Carlos? So I don't know. Did you hear the question? I I, th I think it's the way there's no cash. Well, well, that has also been part of the problem because along along with the extraction of of food, there has also been extraction of of actual bills. Um, again, it's part of a sabotage. So, in order to create strife within the country, there's you know you go to the frontier with Colombia and you could sell and the people would buy uh, uh, Venezuelan Bolivars bills in themselves. And you see, you see how there's many, there's many places. Uh, uh, there, there's been lots of uh, packs of of bolivars found in the border, not only in Venezuela but also in Brazil and other countries, as part of the, you know, the, to to take the cash out of the country and worsen the problems that they already are. Okay, why, why don't we want to make a free election for the president? They are going to be free elections. Okay, everybody, every, everybody knows that it's a trick. Okay, it's no free election. You choose what you want to go for the election. It's not free. You put in the jail. Okay, the other people they can be for the election. You, we are talking here. Everybody likes to democratic. Okay, everybody likes to socialism. It's, it's true. Venezuela is not democratic, and Venezuela is not socialist. It's corruption. It's drug. It's everything. The the, the socialist is very is very different in Venezuela. Okay, Venezuela is not socialist. Venezuela is corruption. It's a drug. It's everything bad. It's not democratic. The people here like the democratic. Okay, people here like the Okay, because we like, but we don't like that they, they are doing in Venezuela. It's no example. You heard, you heard, you heard the comments, questions. Yeah, well, and, and this is also part of, uh, I would say, of, of the campaign. Uh, you know, uh, you have an opposition uh, in Venezuela that keeps saying that there is no, uh, there's no. Uh, Free elections, but at the same time, they don't participate in the elections when they have the chance, and they don't participate because they don't want to, because and 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 they don't participate because their own people that's you know that that would support the uh, the um, the opposition in Venezuela don't don't feel like they have you know good enough leaders to support, and that's the truth, and that's why that's why they haven't been able to you know ever have a strong enough proposal for the Venezuelan people to accept and to vote for them and, and, and put in an office. And when they do what they the first uh, when they did in, in the National Assembly in 2015, you know, very soon they, the people realized that it was a fraud because the first thing they said that they wanted to do 
was be there just to get President Maduro out, but not to take care of the true uh, issues that need that the Venezuelan people need to resolve. What the Venezuelan opposition is doing now, those that claim, like the gentleman over there, that uh, there's no freedom in Venezuela, what they're doing now is going all around the world, getting their own country sanctioned, asking for sanctions on their own country, not caring about what the difficulties that that could entail for their own people, and and then they try to pretend that there's no democracy in Venezuela. Well, I, I find that to be false, because we had a referendum last year where more than almost a million Venezuelans voted to have free election. But we know the national electoral system is worthless. It's completely bought by the government. We've had elections for 18 years, and we cannot get rid of you. Yeah, because you can't get people to vote for you. That's the whole thing. Because because you don't complain about the system when you get Capriles elected as governor, when you get you know the opposition in, in, in elected into into the national assembly. You only complain when you lose. So that's why you know uh, uh, the, the the problem is not the electoral system. The problem is that you have no platform to sell to the people. The company that created the machine to use for electoral system in Venezuela has actually said last year how the results of the national the person who said that was uh, was somebody that worked uh, at that used to work at the uh, 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 one of the companies that who lost contracts uh, with the National Electoral Council and who has absolutely no way of proving that because that company wasn't even part of the of the set of checks that they have to go through. Um, to in order to to you know to get the data of the electoral data, there's no way that person could say or could know if there were uh, votes, uh, um, you know, uh, a million votes uh, counted or not counted. Again, at the end of the day, what you have is a uh, is a set of of speakers that come out and and try to you know set all these uh, attacks on the Venezuelan voting system that has been you know by many people. Uh, here in the United States and everywhere else around the world, that have been, has been recognized as one of the most efficient and and and, and the most uh, one of the most uh, transparent uh, voting systems in the world. Again, the opposition only complains when they lose, not when they won. It cannot be efficient when you're not there facing any of the problems they're facing. Sorry, I don't understand. It, it, it's the government, the system of Venezuela efficient because he's not there to face any other hardships that the people of Venezuela are facing. He's very comfortable living in the United States where he has a vote in a state and he's got many options and everything works for him. And he's got medical care and he's got the police that take care of him and he's got every kind of comfort that he can think of. None of that was available to the, gov to the people of Venezuela. You're speaking about Maduro? No, I think she's talking about Carlos himself. About you, myself? Carlos yeah. himself, right? Yeah. yeah, well, I'm in a, I'm, I'm okay. I represent my country here, and 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 of course, I have to be outside the country. And but I do have family in Venezuela that, that you know that face the same difficulties that anybody would face. And you're here, and you're not facing the difficulties that you you know. I mean, that that's not even an argument. Um, you know, uh, it's a distraction. Sorry. What I'm arguing is why you're calling the system efficient when it's clearly not. It has Could, been here. She said, "What? Why you? Uh, why are you calling the, the system efficient? Yeah. Um, when it's clearly not is the is the point that she made. The voting system is efficient. I'm not saying. Uh, bring me proofs that there's bring me bring me some tangible proof. Not not just what you think and say, but bring me some tangible proof. Bring bring." Look at anything that that with paper, with some you know, with something backing that says that there has been any tampering with the Venezuelan electoral system. Then we'll talk about it. But honestly, you know, you have all you have you have reports from many people that have gone at one point. Even President Carter, who you know, don't tell me President Carter is a socialist or anybody that wants to you know do uh, uh, promote uh, uh, you know the the Venezuelan revolution around the world or anything to that effect, and that recognizing that the system works. I mean, again, don't try to hide your, you know, the, the, the problem that there is no platform that, is, that, that the people would, would want to vote for on the side of the Venezuelan right, 
and try to say that the problem is the voting system when the voting system is the, one of the most modern the, you know, ones that there are all over the world. So, any other, any other, come back, any other questions, anybody? So, uh, glad you touched on everything that you touched on. Uh, clearly, we have some differences of opinion in the room, but uh, as long as, in my opinion, uh, that the step up of militarism on, on the part of the U.S. Uh, on the borders of Venezuela with Colombia and Brazil is a direct response to the attempt at deepening democracy with the uh, expansion of the uh, uh, what are they? The constituent Assembly. The constituent Assembly. Mm -hmm. My first question to you is the revision of the uh, Constitution that the Constituent Assembly and the government uh, took on. Has that been completed? Has that new Constitution been ratified? What's the state of no, that, that, that's a process that's still ongoing, and, that, and that's a process that has also uh, has had to uh, take other responsibilities as well, given that the, the, you know, the current National Assembly that was elected in 2015 is in contempt of, of Venezuelan law and is not able to exercise actual legislative actions. And so part of the, uh, the issues that the Constituent Assembly has had to, be, to deal with is, you know, solve the, you know, the void that has been left um, by uh, the the National Assembly. But it is a process that is ongoing. It's a process that uh, is set to, um, to it has a, uh, about a two year duration process. Um, and it only started last year. So, you know, there's more that's going to be, uh, 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 that we're going to see of the Constituent Assembly uh, for a while. Um, but it has, for, for example, approved something, uh, or out of the things that it has approved, uh, for example, approve a, a law on, uh, against, uh, hate crimes um, that were uh, committed during the protests in 2017, for example, um, we had a number of people that were actually attacked based on what they looked like, uh, based on their appearance and uh, whether it be their skin color, or whether it be uh, their, you know, the, the clothes they were wearing, they were called out as being Chavistas, or these are people that are part of or, or government supporters without there any being any, any um, you know, uh, without their, without they attacking any of the protesters or without there being any approval of, of this. And some of these people were actually set on fire. Um, there's, there's over 23 cases of people that were lit on fire during their protests, five of which died. Um, and so one of the things that, um, that the Constituent Assembly did was come back and, and, uh, and issue uh, um, a, a law on, uh, against uh, hate crimes. Uh, another thing that the Constituent Assembly did was make some very important changes in the Attorney General's office in order to uh, prosecute corruption cases that uh, had been a problem before. And right now, there's a large corruption investigation against uh, or within you know, the you know, the oil company um, and to try to uh, to solve you know the the, the corruption uh, problems that had been uh, there uh, a while back. Do I understand you correctly that the Constituent Assembly still has to change over the Constitution for the laws that they try to enact to take effect? Is that part of the two-year process or the ratification? So part of the two-year process means that you, you're going to, I mean, the, some of the laws that have, that have been in place are going to be reviewed and, and, and see, are more, oh, I should say this, the, the Constitution that's, that is in place has to be reviewed and somehow, you know, adapted, modified, and the discussions on how to do that. But that's, a, that's an ongoing process. It's not something that has been already been said, and it'll, it'll take a while for, for it to, to have a final product. One more question, I guess. Sure. Other people. Um, so that two and a half billion that's tied up with the sanctions uh, with U.S. and U.S. affiliated banks, is there any plan, or do you guys see any way of uh, recapturing that capital? Uh, in any That's a, it's a problem because it's, it's, it's floating on the banks. I mean, it's, it's something like, uh, let's say I'm going to buy something from you and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make you a payment. I put the money in the bank and then it stops there. So it, I, I can get, but I can get, get it back and it can get to you. And unless the bank frees it, um, you know, there's nothing we can do with that. Is there, is that not, is that not an issue that can be taken to the WTO or something? Uh, one of the dispute mechanisms. I'm assuming well, you know, it, it'd be challenging. 
Well, it's complicated because some of these some of these enactments are not necessarily direct. Uh, you know, the, they're not explicitly contained in the sanctions. There are actions that that uh, banks take upon themselves because of sanctions. So, by the logic, uh, you're a sanctioned person. I don't want to deal with your money, so I'm going to analyze this money for however long time that I feel like, and you know, I, there's no. Nobody's going to pressure. I mean, there's there's no pressure for me to give it back to you. So it's 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 a it's a complicated uh, issue in that sense, and it's not um and it's something that we've been denouncing all along for you know for the last uh you know ever since these sanctions were put into place, that as long as these sanctions are there, you know there there's important uh, actions that the Venezuelan government is not being being able to take because um, there's no access to, to those resources. And I guess a related question, I don't know if anybody else has, but a related question. Um, um, the cryptocurrency launch. Um, could you give us a little sense of you know how that's working, uh, flowing, uh, and the, some of the thinking around how that's going to uh, be utilized in terms of international like currency exchange, or is it just primarily going to be uh, more of an in, in internal market mechanism? So it's so it's something that's still on a, on a, um, on the very early stages. Um, but but it, but it basically tells you that this currency that is backed by uh, the oil reserves we have and you know, a specific set of oil reserves that we have, that that makes a you know that gives the strength and and, and it doesn't. It, it allows it not to be tied to these uh, induced inflation problems that we've been having in the border, or like the gentleman was saying, you know, the cash extraction, or, or you know, all these other things. I mean, it's something that won't depend on any of that. Um, and for now, it's been, you know, it's going to be used uh, for, for example, uh, payments of uh, um, certain public services, um, things of that sort. There's there, there's still processes now being uh, carried out so that people can. Uh, register and being able to to purchase these, uh, these uh, the petros and and be able to deal with them. So there's there's a there's different stages that still have to uh, take place. But the idea is to have a, a currency that is now somehow stronger than uh, the current currency and that is not dependent on those uh, fluctuations. By the way, this is something this is something that you know not only Venezuela is thinking about, but there's other countries that already um, I mentioned some interest, including Russia and and others. And there's something that that has been talked about for a long time, especially within oil-producing countries. And a way, uh, you know, trying to find a way to back currency uh, with oil production, as uh, opposed with, uh, you know, supposed to um, non-organic or you know, uh, currency. So a related question, I was going to let that go, but I, I, I know that, that some of that history, and I guess the, 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 the question is how, are there any kind of direct relations or, or dialogue, particularly with Saudi Arabia on this question to monitor kind of oil flow and production, you know, given what they've been doing in OPEC the last four or five years? We have constant conversations with all members of OPEC. Um, you know, part of the fact that, that we we still part of the you know there, there's quotas that, that we um, um, currently follow um, in, in in agreement uh, in a way to try to maintain the prices uh, at a steady um, position. Um, so there's di there's different conversations. I'm I'm not aware that we're doing any specific conversations related to this case, uh, Pedro, but but there is. Always constant conversations uh, regarding, you know, oil prices and how we could work together. There's not always agreement on on, on the countries of OPEC, but um, but there is definitely um, conversation dialogue on on how to go about that. Um, anybody else got any question? I got another one. I got a question, and I don't understand the international banking, but you have alliances with other countries. For example, I don't know, China, you mentioned China earlier, or some other country. Okay, mm -hmm. so money is tied up in the U.S. sanctions. I would go to another country and say, hey, I got this money tied up. Can you cross me or can you buy something for me and send it here to Venezuela? Mm -hmm. And you know I got the money sitting here waiting. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. The problem is the money. Uh, the, it's a little more complicated because the, the money is actually in U.S. bank or it's through U.S. banks. So, so you, it's it's hard to move it uh, with U.S. restrictions. It's um, if the money uh, also. Um, Many of the bonds that Venezuela has, so many of the things that Venezuela has issued, has been have been issued by U.S. banks. So, for trading or for using them in any sort of way, you know, the, you have to have uh, authorization from the U.S. So, we could think about doing that in the future, so to speak. I mean, not or not 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 uh, doing these things uh, so dependent on on the U.S. market. But the things that we have now, or that we've had for many years, I mean, these are bonds that, you know, the run over, uh, you know, 10 to 20 years or so, um, they're connected to the U.S. Uh, market anyway. And anything that sort of, anything that is connected to the U.S., whether it be because it passes through its banks, whether it be because it's issued by one of the banks, whether it's handled by one of, uh, or a U.S. citizen or a U.S., company uh, thought of uh, as a U.S. person in definition, any of that is subject to sanctions and it's difficult to uh, to move it in, in any other way. Don't deal with it, U.S. Bank. Can you but we, a friend from somewhere else and say, hey, bro, I need food, I need grain. And in the future, my future or our reserves or money will be paid to you with a percentage. You, know, you do that and just eliminate the U.S. We could do that again. We could do that in the future. I mean, I mean, it's something that we, that we need to think about. But what, but the things that we have now that that are in the banks or that are bonds or that are you know that are existent are tied to U.S. banks. So I mean, we, we can't just forget that because that is a, that is an, a substantial amount of of, of you know, Venezuelan uh, interests are already there, and that we can't we can't revert because they're already in the system. So there, there's. I'm a, not understand. I don't think he's understanding. No, he he understands. I wouldn't deal with the U.S. I had all the countries turning but back. But you need to. <laughs> That's no, the thing. China, there's Russia, there's North Korea. They'd be happy to help you. No, but the, so the, 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 the we put it this way. I, I know that there are many countries trying to do exactly what you're saying. Right? That that has been an issue for for most of the last 70 years in, in one respect or another, particularly with the, the so-called third world developing countries. There was even a, a program that got pushed, large Cuba's leadership called the, the New International Economic Order. That's right. Uh, through uh, the United Nations in, in, in the 1970s up to the early 1980s. United Nations don't count. No, I'm, what I'm, what I mean, I'm, I understand. What I'm saying is that the, after World War II, um, the United States, with allies, but primarily with the United States, established a, a global international finance mm -hmm. system. Right. Uh, and we have, nobody has been able to break out of that system yet. Nobody. Not even China. China is now probably taking the lead in in both demanding that there be uh, new forms of currency that are used as a form of, of currency exchange. Um, they've been putting that issue to the forefront. The BRICS countries, uh, which is was uh, uh, Brazil, uh, India, China, uh, South Africa, and Russia, uh, went through the extent of creating some of their own financial institutions and, and loans, forms of currency exchange to try to break the stranglehold. Um, but nobody's completely been able to extract themselves from that Don't yet. do money, barter. That, Can that, you barter? I think they're trying that. So even yeah, but, but, but again, Again, there are things that can be done in the future, and there's things that are being done with Russia, China, with other countries that, that, that we have a you know economic relationship with. That doesn't mean that we that we don't have to take care of what we already have in U.S. banks. That's what I'm trying to say. That you know, regardless of regardless if we are trying to do all, all these alternative things, I mean, the Petro is in a way also an alternative that doesn't have to go through um, U.S. Uh, banks. 
Um, but if we don't have, uh, but but we we have to do something about the money that we do have through U.S. banks. You know what I'm saying? I agree. I, I understand that, but you know you're going to be dealing with that anyway. Mm -hmm. But in a problem, is yeah. there some bartering or some negotiation you can do with the country? Well, there is, but I mean, yeah. but look at it in, in, in this way: like, what what's some of the challenges? Like. Uh, Babies with no food. That's no, 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 we know that. Mothers with What I'm saying, but the challenge is, can I dictate to your private company, right, that you now have to bank with my currency and not the U.S. dollar? Which one do you want to get paid in? I don't deal with money at all. No, but if you are this this, this person, you're not the country. Okay. It's the right? country and you're a corporate and you're, and you're owner a corporate of, 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 you know, of, of, of a company. Which one do you want to get paid in? Most people want to get paid in U.S. dollars. It's not backed by the U.S. military. It's backed by the U.S. military. It's backed by something that the yeah. U.S. military. <laughs> uh, uh, and it's enforcement mechanism. So the, 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 there's something behind it. You might not like what's behind it, right. but there's something right. that's behind it. Uh, and they got, they got, you know, the whole thing. We got, we got ways, of, we got ways to fix the call. Um, you know, and we got made ways to make you squeal. So that that's what the, I think the deal is. How much was inflation the, the last year in Venezuela? I didn't hear what he said. How much was the inflation in Venezuela last year? No, I don't have the exact amount, but I know the World Bank is uh, um, the IMF uh, also is making is making up uh, uh, numbers with with. Um, Num uh, with items they don't have, so it's part of the uh, you know part of also the construction of, of uh, but there is a high inflation. I mean that's that's not that's not the point. I, I you know nobody's saying that there isn't, but what, what you have to understand is the factors that are bringing up the the high inflation. Ten thousand. That's by design. Ten thousand for uh, percent for inflation. How much? No, no, no. How much? I don't know the number. Yeah, but when the U.S. is manufacturing oil prices to be lower through pumping out shale or having OPEC pump out or billions of gallons, the main thing was, frac was, was frac fracking. Was fracking, 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 not fracking, fracking. You know, flooding the market with fracking oil and OPEC oil, and depending on countries that are dependent on oil, they're all going to be hurt. You know, Russia is suffering not as much as Venezuela. But how is that the U.S. problem? Why is it not the? I'm not saying it's a U.S. problem. I'm saying it's a U.S. attack on Venezuela. The country that is just not oil. Say again. How, how can they not figure out how to bring money into the country that is just not oil? He just spent a large part of the conversation saying it's a, a country that's been dependent on oil for a hundred years, and you don't turn, you don't get out of that in 18 years. They didn't even try. That's not what well, I'm hearing. No, that's not true. I mean, there's there's attempts, but again, you know, the system, the system is built so in a, in a way that you don't, you know, it's not easy to just, you know, it's not something you turn off and go away. Um, and you know, there's there's things you have to pay, and there's and again, there's a, there's a very important social uh, issue that you had to take care of before that 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 had to be the priority over you know the other things. That's not to say that more things could have been done. There's a lot of trial and error, and a lot of the trial, you know, didn't come out as well as uh, as was planned. But you have to understand that, you know, it, at, different w from other countries that in Latin America that lived through an industrialization process in the 1950s and 60s, Venezuela didn't undergo that. Venezuela has a, a parasitic uh, 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 bourgeoisie that, that basically is, you know, is, uh, has been depending on on com commercializing imports but not on actually building something productive. And then that's, you know, then, then that, that, that's a problem that's is structural. That's something that's solved overnight. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I hear your point, but I would say like here in the state of Mississippi, we now, what, a hundred and almost 50 years past the, the, the end of chattel slavery. And it's still uh, uh, a right. state which is primarily still dominated by agriculture, um, you know, as its, as its number one product. So its relationship within the overall structure of the U.S. economy and the global economy really has not changed in about 200 years since since the state was fundamentally founded. Now that's something we want changed. 
um, that's something you know our institution is trying to change in our own small uh, way. Uh, but the the elite forces here uh, could have changed this a long time ago uh, if they had wanted to, if they had chosen to. But 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 and that doesn't mean some of them didn't try. Uh, to even give them credit, it doesn't mean that some of them didn't try. Uh, but removing yourself from how the international economy is going back to your point, how the international economy is actually structured is not easy. That's a difficult challenge, you know. Uh, um, that you know, it that it, 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 it I would say it exists independent of our will because it's a structural dynamic, it's not just a political dynamic that you know we can snap our fingers and say it's going, it's going to change. Uh, because it's a, the, the economy and like society is a complex beast, you know. Uh, you alter one thing, you improve something, but you hurt something else, you know. Like, uh, uh, but you got all those di different dynamics. I think at, at, at play. I think the to me it seems like the um, uh, the critical thing is how do we learn from our mistakes, and how do we build new processes to correct those. You know, at the same time, trying to service the broad, you know, the the broad social needs in any society in any country. That's that's what I think the real question is. And I don't think none of us completely figured that out. I don't. Uh, it hasn't been figured out in the United States, um, for sure. Um, How can I help? How can we help as an individual, as a group? What would the success that we do? I, I think it's important that, um, first of all, to, you know, to, to um, you know, get this information out in the sense, or, you know, be able to, to, to uh, tell people about, about uh, the situation. And also to, to um, it's important, it's, it's important that, that People understand here, or at least that you know, the the government understands the um, the problems that sanctions cause. I mean, and and how you know you can't you can't deal with political differences, or you know, and by re resorting to unilateral actions, by resorting to intervention, by resorting to to those practices. I mean, you have to you. How about you know sitting down in dialogue? I mean, how about doing all the all the the other things that that you know diplomacy should be about? How about not you know violating international law and applying sanctions on a country that you have no right to apply sanctions on because it's extraterritorial and you shouldn't be doing that? Um, I think the the aware it's important to raise awareness on those on on issues of 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 the of the sort. The primary partner is Russia. I can't hear anything. Saying the only sanctions uh, that are coming right now are from everybody except Russia. The only trading partner that they have is Russia. And so, though US companies and OPEC companies and companies all around the world want to do oil production there, they can't do it because. Sanctions are unilaterally accepted across the board, except for Russia. And Russia will try to help them pump oil, but it doesn't really work real well either, because they got plenty of oil already. So they don't really have anything to gain by producing or pumping any oil. But the humanitarian crisis is what's keeping them from releasing sanctions. Did, did you hear that? There is, there is, there is no whole humanitarian crisis because First of all, when you, when you talk about humanitarian crisis, you have then you know it's part of the uh, 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 of the justification precisely for intervention, because when you talk about humanitarian crisis, when you really have no access whatsoever to food, you have no access whatsoever to uh, medicine, and you know these are things that happen in war zones or it happens where there's a you know uh, natural disaster, you know like like Hurricane Katrina was at one point, and and, and I know you guys. Uh, uh, Live through that as as well. I mean, that that you have high prices for for food because there's an, a, you know a rough economic situation. Fine, but that doesn't mean that there's no access at all. I mean, and 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 the the issue of using uh, you know the 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 word humanitarian uh, humanitarian crisis is precisely 
because it, what you're trying to justify is a uh, is, uh, intervention, an international intervention. You know, you have the case, uh, uh, there's all these keywords that are, that are coming up now, you know, the, the people talk about, about uh, refugees in the, in the border, and they talk about that because... Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm going to... So, oh, so my end or your end, Carlos, you're breaking up a little bit. Okay. Some people talk about, uh, some people are now are talking about using the term refugees in Colombia, for example. Colombia tr is trying to use that because if, if they do so, the, the, you know, the, uh, if it's accepted as such that Venezuelan migrants going to Colombia are refugees, which means people that, whose lives are at risk of being persecuted, then they could ask for the UN for funds in order to take care of those people. And that's something that the, the Colombian government is trying to promote. So you really have to be careful with those keywords because what they're trying to do is use those in order to justify intervention or to have some, some gain in of, in of itself. So it's not to say there's not a, an economic situation that's difficult. It's not to say that there aren't problems. But you can't confuse one thing with the other. I mean, Venezuela is not a war zone. Venezuela is not a natural disaster. Venezuela is a country that's facing economic difficulties. And if you put sanctions on it, it's going to be much worse. They're trying to change a currency and make a digital currency. One of their solutions. Yeah, but they're basing that on oil. They're saying that one, one Venezuelan digital coin will be worth every barrel that they, that they have. But they, they, haven't, they haven't pumped any of it yet. How they you obviously don't understand how currencies work and, and what it means to be backed. That doesn't mean necessarily that you're going to trade the coin for an oil barrel. I mean, there's, there's something that backs the value of the currency, not that, you know, uh, it, it's tradable. But, you know, you could read up on that a little bit and, and find out. So, but how will the, how will the barrel be barrel back? Again, you could read up in the literature and try to understand what it means that a currency is backed by oil or by gold or by how, how currencies work and then, you know, you can find out more. Is that because you don't understand it either and cannot explain it? No, I'm saying that there's, there's you know, currencies are backed by certain things that, you know, have value to it. It doesn't mean that you necessarily are pumping out a, a barrel of oil. There's reserves in land and, and then because there's value on those uh, on, on those reserves, that is what is, the, you know, backing up the currency. No, I, I agree with you there. I agree. That's the whole premise is that they're going to issue coin, a digital coin, based on oil that an oil reserve, a barrel that is tucked away underground, not yet produced. But if they can't, but if they can't produce it, it's not really all right. So let's let's set aside currency. How, how is that changing the currency? How exactly will changing the currency help anyway? I mean, they're. You say that's his way of getting around the U.S. sanctions and all the money that's set up in the U.S. right now. I mean, that's just one of their solutions. I, I don't know what else they want to do to solve the problem or stabilize their. Because they do have a major currency problem. And that's the biggest problem with buying in food is, is their currency problems. Well, when you have, when you're trying to depart from the dependency on that specific currency and trying to find other alternatives to, uh, that don't fluctuate the way the other currency does, that's, that's one of the solutions that you, you're going after. Any other questions, folks? Where's Chucho? He's over here. <laughs> I agree with Sando. You want to come come up here? I don't know if everybody can hear you or see No, no, try no. I am general consul of the and I tried for California, okay, come here, but if you want to be the role of Chavez, for the distribution of the role around the world, you know, it's an institution. It's only for the key drivers, for the mention, for example, Africa, 
um, uh, an African diaspora in America Latina. I, I work for a long time in, in Angola for a year. I was ambassador in Angola, Sato Me Principe Zambia, and after in Mali, uh, Burkina Faso. And that experience is very important before Chavez, no connection we have, only two embassies. And after Chavez, this 18 uh, embassy and relation with all on Africa. And now continue that position. The other position of Chavez, contribution of Chavez is, uh, I don't know, it's good. It's funny. No, it's the reconfiguration. <laughs> the reconfiguration, the uh, connection between, for example, America Latina. Is the position uh, two in two way very radical, no? For example, Petro Caribe, no? And the other is uh, Alba, Bolivarian alternative for the country, no? It's, it's, it's good, it's good for the uh, The other is the uh, open many, for example, the participation of black people. Before Chavez, no is possible, no? The positive de participation de blood in Venezuela, for example, the, uh, the land, the situation of the land, that is very important for the people, no? that is this core that we, we people, the black people in, in Venezuela, for example, I am from Barlovento, no? Barlovento rich in cacao and water, and, 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 and now I have, we have the power of the cacao. The cacao now is only for the monopoly, okay? This one is simple. The other is, for example, Cali traveled the last year to Yaracuy mm -hmm. for one uh, meeting around the world for the participation of people of Africa, Indian, and, and other for the land. Mm -hmm. What happened in the land? What happened with the company in the land? No, for example, uh, this, this thing, the semilla. Sí. Sí. The control of the sea, Monsanto, Calvir, and, and other, no? Chavez don't accept that. Okay, that, that is one contribution very important. And the last letter to Chavez for the African people is before he died, he say, he say, okay, it's very important, the unique in Africa and the diaspora. It's similar the speed, for example, Kwame Krumah, no, when Kwame Krumah, remember, Kwame Krumah had many influence in the social movement, black radical here in the United States, for example, in Malcolm X. When Malcolm X is separation of the, um, the Muslim, the House of Muslim, he creation of the African Union, similar to the African Union in Africa. No, for Kwame Krumah, Sekoture, and Chavez, Chavez pay attention, for example, when Julio Nyerere speaks the relation so to Julio Nyerere, Tanzania, that's it one co contribution very important for Chavez. Okay, when Chavez opened the democracy, it's a reality. I don't know why. Eh, niega eso. <risa> no sé cómo es. Ok, ok. Ayúdame, ayúdame, porque después voy a entrar con ustedes un poquito, ¿no? Porque parece un humor como plano para hablar y discutir. Eh, sí. Así, claramente, está bien razonado. Después vamos a hablar de Don Espíritu o Romanticismo. Ok. En Venezuela, there is one reality, very difficult. Y tenemos que hablar con el corazón, con el alma y con las proposiciones en que creemos. Porque the problem in Venezuela, the solution is between, entre, between the, entre nosotros. ¿Cómo? A ver, ¿Cómo? 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 Okay, but that is very important. And that for that I I that exposition here, 
and the or the Chavez, for example, the contribution for the black and Latino and and, and for people here in the United States, very important in the time the, the, the people that is no conflict here. Remember when yeah, I am not political in that moment. I am not participating in the Chavez government. But I am militant, similar to to Cali and many people here. I come here with Katrina. She invitation to me, and and we write one letter to Charles for support to the people in Katrina. Or it's similar when the shipper oil, when write one letter for Exxon, for. Uh, other company, yes, yes, and other for the okay. Entonces, only Cisco, only Cisco contribution for the people, and the bad uh, that that project begin in Boston. And matter is, I, I work in that. For many indigenous people, black people, and more than two million of personas. Okay, Chavez think that the suit is in the deep suit. But, but, but you know, Chavez was very, very poor when he was suppressed. Very poor. This guy was very, very rich. Although you can't explain because. He, 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 the money for, for pay him. So, okay. Come on, be, be serious. You have, you have nowhere to base that on, and you're distracting from a conversation that's being serious. If you're going to be, if you're going to try to do something and, and, you know, put your point out, do it in a serious way. Don't, don't, don't mess with people's time. Why do you say, why do you say that he's not laughing here? Where is he? Where is he? Where Where do you take? What proof do you, do you have? Where are you saying that Chavez has money when he died? Come on, don't yeah. waste people's time. I want to first say to my country that became a militant only after he released some free time he ran from prison, and by the time he died, he was a man wearing Rolex and the same clothes. But the drawing the parallel between what's happening in Mississippi. And what's happened there? We don't have we don't have oil like Venezuela, but we have other resources, and it's still largely capitalized by people other than the people. I mean, really, this is about what can we learn for the benefit of the people. And ultimately, without redistricting, without us, we have the largest representation of minorities in the legislature than any other place in the country. And we're still slug we're still slugging around on the bottom. Because we are uh, not able to get initiative 42 passed. Another, another thing. <laughs> <laughs> we're 49. <laughs> so, oh, oh, okay. I'm 49, but, but we to to say, the you know what I mean? <laughs> we we, 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 we got to learn what we can about, uh, you know, our round folks owning Venezuela now. Is it owned? Because I mean, is that how it's run? Is that how it's owned? Can we find a way to have the constituents, the owners of land in Mississippi or, or resources in Mississippi, lumber is one, chickens and eggs are one of the exports. Right? I mean, we, we do have oil, but nothing is owned domestically on the coast. It's all, you know, it's all national produced. And what can we learn about Venezuela that we can apply in Mississippi? That's that's a question. That's a serious question. Uh, did you understand the, the question, Chico? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Par Carlos? Oh, no, sir. I, I know at one of the uh, five words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, 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 okay. <coughs> No, pero es que lo, lo, lo que estábamos hablando, Ajá. quieres que hablemos en español. Ok, un poquito, sí, gracias. La, la hija de Chávez fue la más rica. Ella, porque ya no hizo crema jabón, 
su fortuna, pero es la mujer más rica de América. ¿Cómo no, puede explicar sí, sí, sí. si el papá era pobre, siendo un sueldo sí, sí. militar, okay. siendo sino una persona? Ok, pero mira, pero da, 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 da cuestión que es similar, en el IRI, ahí dicen de las drogas, por ejemplo. Si, if that no is confirmation, no is confirmation, I can't speak with that. No, it's confirmation. You know, you know, you know, with the, with the United States, no, that Chavez, Chavez daughter had many money. The United States don't publish. Quickly. Mira, it's similar in the moment. I didn't know what the problem was. The son, the daughter of the President of Santo, Isabel of Santo, everybody say, I know her. That is the woman more rich in Africa. Okay, everybody. Change the government, but it's the government of the president. It's the partido. En pela. Okay. Mismo partido. And now there is one revolution in the party. And now Isabel dos Santos discovered that had money, many money, the diamante. Las minas de diamante, por ejemplo. Claro. Pero en this case, no. With the, you had the, no tienen la prueba. Yo no, yo no puedo hablar. When you say corruption, yes. Corruption, yes. Ay. And I don't talk. I don't talk. Yo no digo ahora. When Chávez leave, I find it. And the people say, Chucho, it's possible that you get out. You get out in, in, in Angola for you right very strong. Okay, I wait my time. In this time, okay, look in the corruption. And there are more people corruption. That is my position, revolutionary. Because I am revolutionary before Chavez. Okay, revolution is, is, is okay. But before you can, Chavez no was revolution. He used the, the revolution name, but he has stolen the money because he paid the money for the country and uh, uh, he for Cuba. Venezuela in 10 years pay, uh, give more money for Cuba than 30 years the, the United Soviet did. Uh, you, you, do you, <coughs> do you remember many years ago? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, have, have Venezuela, give, Venezuela give money for all the country, in Caribbean country, give for everybody. Okay, but right now, right now, the people in Venezuela is dying, is no eat, is no food. My family is in Venezuela. They are living very, very hard time. Not only my family, the family for everybody. I have a lot of video. If you want to see the real, real Venezuela, go for CNN, go for this uh, news, and to see the real, okay? Because he, he, told, he told everything that he liked. It is not real Venezuela. It's the Venezuela in his mind. You know, Chavez did the best constitution, the best constitution, brand new in 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 nine. He told the Venezuela has the constitution for two hundred years. Now the, the the Maduro he made something like a over constitution. It's over constitution, uh, and he want to change. But you know, here in United States, you can talk. So you, need to, you, you, you need to do too many things. Nobody wants to change the constitution. Okay? In no. Venezuela, they, they. That's they, not a good example. <laughs> they, they make a lesson with these people, his people, and say, here, okay, we are over the constitution. But you read the constitution, you ne never, never read uh, about the. the uh, um, what, what is the name? Uh, about the communists, about the communists, about everything. Okay. And now they told, they, when they put together, they say, okay, we are over constitution. It's not true. It's no constitution. Why he want to change? Is Chavez told that we have the constitution for 200 years? In few years after, he want to change everything? Coño, te entendí. Te entendí. Okay. Okay, 
house. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. They, they, Chavez changed the constitution, but no, it's for Chavez changed the constitution for Chavez. It's a ratio. It's, it's, no, 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 no. I participation. Okay, with Chavez, yeah. It's right possible now. that you, you, you participation for transformation of the constitution in Venezuela uh -huh. in this time, 1999, no? Yes. Okay, everybody participation, black, Indian, homosexual, gay, lesbian, all, all everybody. Okay, okay. And remember, for example, the, the, the third part when the talk. The constitution say that this new constitution at is solidarity with the people. Around the world, remember that, uh -huh. uh, and that solidarity, no, is similar to the United States. The solidarity United States is for pay the recursos. Remember, for example, in Mali, I live in Mali for one year. I am know what the meaning the humanity mission. Mm -hmm. In 12, in, el, in, in the year 2012, I write the humanity French, United States, England, Spain, and they continue because they continue in Mali uh, for uranium, for gold. Okay, that's easy. I understand that. I understand that. I, yo reconozco, no, escúchame, escúchame, ayúdame tú. I recognize. Eh. <laughs> yo reconozco lo que me estás diciendo en el sentido, en el, en el sentido de, de, de yo también tengo familia, ¿me entiendes? Y en comunidad, en, 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 en situación difícil. Pero hay algo, por ejemplo, por ejemplo, hay when I arrive, I listen to the medicine. What happened? What happened in the medicine? Okay, Carlos speak one part, but the other part is, for example, the Pfizer is company here in the state. Mayor, Bayer, they go to Venezuela for regulation price. It's similar, for example, that progress. Venezuela had with Tillerson. Coño, Tillerson, say, no, no, I am not okay because there is one contradiction. And Chavez in this time. And now Tillerson is action, is Secretary of State, and now go for, como se dice en inglés, ahora voy por la revancha. Now I'm going for the second. Okay. Revenge. Pero hay otra cosa, and uh, it's very important, the autocritic. We think que podíamos, nosotros pensamos, ayúdame aquí, óyeme, ¿cómo se llama usted? Fabiana. Fabiana, fíjate, nosotros pensábamos que podíamos comer un bistec de petróleo. We thought that we could eat a steak of oil. <laughs> no, 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 las haciendas productivas. Venezuela no produce nada. It's, nada. No, pero, Hay que importarlo todo. No, pero es Juan Paz. Remember that Chávez and Aster Maduro give many money for the enterprise buy para comprar insumos por procesamiento de alimentos here in the and the other country. And no es posible. Es Juan bloqueo. I remember somebody here is know the history. I remember IT, for example, in the 19th in the 19th in 19th century. In the 19th un bloqueo porque era otro proyecto. También recuerdo el bloqueo a Cuba en el 20 y ahora el bloqueo a Venezuela en el siglo 21, tres países. So three block three blockades, Haiti in the 19th century. 
Cuba in the 20th century and now Venezuela in the 21st. A Venezuela. Coño, si quieren, si quieren ayudar, tenemos que abrir el diálogo, como tú dices, como tú lo estás planteando. El diálogo es necesario. Pero lo que no, yo no creo que tú, tú y tú estén de acuerdo con una intervención militar. Sí, sí, estoy de acuerdo. Sí, yo, yo sí, estoy, sí estoy de acuerdo con uno. Yeah. Porque es la única persona que ataca a esa gente. Y viejo, mira, tú, viejo. Es la otra gente. Viejo, tú no sabes lo que es una intervención are. militar. Yo fui militar. Sí, estamos. Claro. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué? There is no way for the military to turn against the government. It hasn't happened, and it won't happen at this point. Do you really want to intervene in the United States? We're talking about outside help. Let me flip this. Let me flip this. Why? Because you don't want to be America this time, but we do need outside help. It's your right, but let me flip it by way of example, right? As a descendant of slaves, uh, would it have been my right to ask for somebody to come intervene in the United States? Would they have allowed that? If you thought that you had exhausted every other possibility and it wasn't working, I think that now. I think that now. <laughs> I think that now about the United States government. Mm -hmm. And every day my ancestors have been here, I've thought that. And they have thought that. If you really think that this is bad, you really need to go to other countries. I've been to more countries than you can imagine. Um, and bad is a relative thing, right? Because if you think it's bad in Venezuela, ask the Haitians how they feel about their situation. If you think it's bad in Haiti, ask the folks who are living in slums in Kenya about their situation. The Haitians, they get French support when they Haiti ain't never got no French support from nothing. Never. Yeah, they did. They, they have got a fat debt. They did. They did get debt. You're right about that. And Napoleon but came they, back to bring in slaves. They blocked the Spanish from coming back in. That, that, was, that was the army of the Toussaint L'Overture that blocked them. Let's, let's be clear. That was the army of Toussaint L'Overture that blocked them. But I guess my point is that there was, they, they did ask, like you're saying, you want to add. You would ask for some military support, right? Or you know, I, I mean, let's be clear. If we're going to go into history, it's a it's a historical dynamic that Tucson, in particular, did not feel that his army was sufficient or strong enough in and of itself to forever hold off the United States, the Spanish, the French, uh -huh. and the British. Uh -huh. And what he did for a short period of time was play all the different empires off each other for as long as he could. So he made an ally alliance with the United States for a time. He made an alliance with the Spanish for a time. He made an alliance with the British for a time, recognizing that none of them would ever accept his humanity as an African. Right? And then when the, when the tides turned to a certain extent, he then tried to rebroker a negotiation with the French, understanding that Napoleon was never going to accept him as an equal. And it led to a division within his own ranks, which I would argue is where, where y'all are at now in Venezuela in some critical terms, that led to a division in his own ranks, led to his capture, and then him dying in the French prison, right, as a, as a result of pneumonia. But there was enough consciousness, I would say, amongst the people at that time, and resolved to be free, that the next general in line, Dessalines, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, never accepted any terms of compromise, led the army to independence by fighting total war against all the different invaders. Because it's not like they just defeated the French. The Spanish came back, mm -hmm. and then the British came back for a short period of time, in his short four-year period of being in charge of the government. So if we're going to look at history as being something to be instructive, I think you're going to have to look in some, some different ways and some different things to point out, you know, like where relative suffering uh, is along the change and, and who then gets a right within your society to, to ask for aid. But even Mississippi, how the U.S. support could be redistricting would be 
We have to have. You mean federal our, government support? Without federal government support in the U.S. Department, uh, uh, our redistricting lines have to be approved by the Justice Department. Right. Without approval from the Justice Department, the Republicans would have their way and they'd slice it up and through, and they would, <laughs> but, but this they would slice it up. So I guess my point is that we need to have U.S. government support. Why can't they have Well, it? look, no, this, this is what I would say <laughs> Who can in, in that regard, mm -hmm. that one of the things I think in the United States context that we now have to be cognizant of, if you want to use this framework, I don't like it, but it's a common one. If you want to use the framework that from the 1950s on, the United States went through a second reconstruction. If that's the framework you want to work with, 2016 was the end of that reconstruction, point blank period. Because what has now happened is that the Supreme Court, which mandates this, this federal oversight that you're talking about, yeah. is now controlled by a Republican, ultra-libertarian, conservative, ultra-racist majority that is not going anywhere for a number 25 years. You're talking about the Supreme Court? I'm talking about the Supreme Court and Congress. So if black folks thinking that they're going to rely on the Supreme Court or the federal government from this point forward for any support from these races, that day is long gone. It's, it's over. And we almost back to where we were in 1966. I mean, 1866. 1866. Back in 1866. So... I'm not, that, that's what Venezuelans to determine. I just want to understand why. You know, she's going to advocate for what she's going to advocate for, regardless of my opinion or not. I'm very clear on that. I'm not going to deny you that, that right, right? But I will ask if, if it's a question about the concern of all the people in their humanity within Venezuela, that I would have to ask you and challenge you very seriously, who are, in whose interest are you demanding this intervention? Because I've been to Venezuela at least eight times now. And I was just there, I was just there in November, right? And if you're asking me, have I noticed a difference? Absolutely I've noticed a difference in terms of the deterioration of the living conditions, right? But some of the folks, the living conditions from when I first went there to now have not changed. And it's not necessarily a result because the 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 the, the revolution has failed. It has not had enough time to mature to reach all the different levels and, and, and change the manner of, of production and distribution, right? I don't think there's, and, and this, to me, uh, uh, this is a, 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 if you're talking about a deep uh, uh, a problem in a, in a deep uh, issue, well, let me put it this way. I'm a, I'm a critical supporter of the Venezuelan Bolivarian process, but that doesn't mean I support it uncritically. And that doesn't mean that for me, I don't, as an outside observer, they, that, the process that the folks would have went some other directions, right? But you can say that about any revolution. I would say that about my own efforts in my own work. If I had to do it over again, I probably would have did some things differently, right? But these, this is what I got to live with, and this is this is what I got to work with. Um, the the point that I would hope you guys would look at is number one: don't don't deny the role and the power of the United States government. And don't, I mean, this is almost a replay of what happened uh, in Chile uh, in, in the 1970s. Yeah, with Pinochet. This, I mean, it's the same playbook, the same types of sabotage, the same type of currency manipulation, the same type of resource manipulation. You know, uh, uh, in, in their case, it was, what was it, uh, uh, tin and copper? Copper. Ch Chile. Uh, uh, you know, they, they, they were resource dependent upon primarily, you know, then. Uh, uh, you all have, you know, the, the curse of black gold. Uh, it, it, the playbook from the United States fundamentally hasn't changed. Um, and the class contradictions and the racial contradictions in Venezuela even make the situation more complex than it was in Chile. And that's why I'm asking, as a, as a person of African descent, what I've always seen in the, in the society was that there was a more open in Venezuela. There's a more open process towards people of African descent, but is it completely, to, you know, link, totally bent itself towards, towards liberation? No. And what I've seen very clearly, particularly this last go round, there's a, a very deliberate racist tinge to this resistance from the, the, the uh, uh, Venezuelan elite. 
And I haven't heard anybody within the, 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 the right opposition talk about that. But it's no accident that most of the people that, that I've seen, and I've watched all the videos from the left and the right that I can get my hands on, I haven't seen anybody from the right address the racism of the right. It's almost like it doesn't exist. But it's very clear that the people who are being burnt and hunted look like most of the people in this room. Right, so that's a that's a deep question I'm asking. If if the revolution is going to benefit people who look like you, then I have a problem with. It. If that intervention is only going to be, benefit people who look like you, then I got a serious problem with. It. If you don't think that opening the university, everything else outside of 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 the university, well, what they can mean? actually have access to money in the bank, that they can go get medicines at the hospitals, that they can buy food at the grocery stores. Everything that currently is lacking, and that is a true issue that you probably saw in November, and that's more acute right now. Okay, I will put it to you just by, by way of American example. Right across the street here is, is Stupac. Y'all live in Jackson, I assume, right? Both of you, do, you both live in Jackson. Yeah. Okay, right across the street here is Stupac, one of the largest, if not the largest, homeless provider in the state of Mississippi. There's hundreds of people walk through here every single day grabbing food, right? Now, I can go to almost any grocery store in, in Jackson and find rolls of food available, right? Mm -hmm. So if you mean access that there's food in the grocery store, that's one criteria. Do you mean access that these people can access that food in the grocery store? That's another criteria. Just because there's food in the store, if you want to go back to something that they, they're trying to make it look like old Soviet Union, just because there's food in the store don't mean that everybody can access it or buy it. That just means there's a whole bunch of people who are hidden from sight who are actually starving. And that exists right here in this community. We can tell you that from working and living here in this community. There's hungry people around here starting every day. Exists in every country, even the most developed countries. <laughs> I don't know of one country that has completely erased. I agree with you on that. So I don't think that that's not going to be the total answer by getting help into Venezuela and getting rid of the current government, where it's oh. more free. But it definitely helps the majority of Venezuelans at this point. Hasn't the level of uh, standard of living for the vast majority of Venezuelan people improved since the Bolivarian Revolution? Improved, I would say, has deteriorated. Let me just say this. I mean, but history doesn't start in 2016, 2017, right. 2016. Um, well, I'm sure there was some poor conditions prior to 2000, and then there was some effort to make some improvements. Which is the main support back and forth of our economic system. And can you tell me why the price of oil fell? Which gets to my point earlier. Even prior to that, when, when corn subsidies were adjusted in the United States, it had a dramatic effect. In the 80s and 90s, Reagan said that we were going to start subsidizing our farmers, and then Mexican farmers went broke. Right. Yeah. So you're both making my point about being ahistorical about the Bolivar Revolution. If we're going to blame this crisis on oil prices, it's not like the Venezuelan government ordered, Venezuelan government ordered OPEC to pump out oil five years ago. At, Without seats, or I mean, what we it's can. Not, it's not like the Venezuelan government in court encouraged Exxon, Shell. If they're not helping your your pocket, not filling up your car with four dollars like a gallon to it, I mean, can you? I'm not a player in who who makes oil prices, and who but chooses to make the it. point. Yes, I'm affected by it. prices went up, prices went down. But guess who the big winners are? Those oil, oil companies. companies. Guess who the big losers are? Venezuela. By cheapening the price of oil, you've essentially the U.S. essentially destroyed their economy. Again, but I'm saying it's, it's being acre store for the blame down on the Chavez government. The government to find a better way to bring income to our country, other than just oil. It gets back to his example about the infrastructure that you can't yes. get rid of in five, fifteen, twenty years. Come by later. And I think my initial question has been answered about where all this chaos originated from. Apparently, it did not start with the Chavez, they rest in peace. But either elements up and underneath him, he was not aware of, and undermined him, continued by the Maduro regime or not. But the question was, I think, was answered by the belief that the United States intervention in Venezuela 
idea. You are asking white folks who have never done a damn thing for anybody but themselves historically to go in a country full of dark folk who had no respect for and actually say the only thing that's going to happen, you will change the slave masters. White folks will run in your country. You will be the pet house folk doing their bidding for their benefit. White people have historically proven their treachery, their deceit, their status of supremacy, and the racial hatreds, that not just with, with us, but with each other, throughout their entire existence on their planet. But you have to ask them to bolster either Brazil and or Colombia to intervene. That's what they get their hands dirty. They're asking you to do their dirty work as their shock troops for their benefit. But therefore, what that boils, what that boils down to is the Sopranos, so to speak, believing in your house. You will be pushed out to the court, to, out, out to the backyard, and white folks, American white folks, with their very arrogant and supremacist view of themselves, the rest of the world, be telling you, no, you are you brown piece of crap, are no longer in charge. This is our country. Now, who work for us? Go ahead, ask for the intervention. It will prove me right. We're coming back to us to ask you to help us help you get rid of them. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna tell you your price has gone up. <laughs> you want what I'll help, this will have to happen. Black folk here and Venezuela get first crack at all the benefits they have stolen from you to make sure so everybody's boat lifts up. You want to be free? Do not ask white folk for their for that help. They will add new change and other ones on you, the ones you already had. And for that Mississippi, it wasn't for a black man, this man knew very well, Henry Kirksey, be drawing the district lines in this state. White folks would still have a supermajority here. And white folks in Washington, she didn't give a damn about what was going on Mississippi until black folk like this man and Henry J. Kirksey and Randall Hammer wrote and told them, the hell with y'all, we're going to burn this sucker down before you let, let you run it any, run any further into the ground that you already have. White folks are not the answer. They are your curse. Trust us when we tell you this. What I just don't think, Merkel, the red, white, and blue is going to save us. Yeah, uh huh. I expect you to be in no, in no nice Chinese shop by, 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 by the end of this week. <laughs> and that's the truth. <laughs> okay, all right. right for them, that's the truth. Your clothes out there. We got this. We're home. Okay. Appreciate y'all coming. I, I really like it. And raising the point and, 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 and engaging in the debate. Mm. Okay, I, um, the, last, the last week, for example, <coughs> Carlo and me um, go to the Congress, no, for explain to the black caucus what is the situation, and we posit that in one month the black caucus, two or three congressmen and congresswoman go to Venezuela, and my position, Carlo is witness. I told you it's very important that you go to Venezuela and you see the reality and you say your opinion, not only the government and organization, one meeting with the opposition. La mu, al que sea, entiende, ve? La mu, ustedes son... Bueno, ve, coño, pero como así. Oh, bueno. <laughs> pero queremos, my position is that they go to Venezuela and I don't, ellos no creen en lo que yo digo. That Carlos a mí say, ellos van a Venezuela y no es que los vamos a llevar donde nosotros queremos todo bonito. No, no, no. I see the reality. Ver, Para que yo vea la reality, la realidad, por see, see the reality. Okay. And, and meeting with the opposition. Move or no move. 
y oposición, porque okay. es otra opinión similar a you And I am sure, <laughs> porque last week, many people, and excuse me, no es last, pero it's all 20, 20, 20 people, white people of Venezuela, go to Congress for demand, the intervention militar. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that, Marcos Rubio and Ileana Ross say that. Say, okay, intervention militar yeah. in Venezuela. It's Ileana, no, it's all the Congress, five people in the Congress, Republican <laughs> people. Okay, other people, Democrat, don't want, no, don't want that. They, they're looking other way. And yes, they ask to me, coño, what happened? It's, it's the opinion that you say, coño, what's happening? Three or no three? Como es? Okay, come here. Come here and ask the question in Venezuela. Okay? Okay. You go and you see. Too bad. You, you go for see what is the reality. No, it's my reality. No, it's my opinion. It's the opinion of the people. That is the challenger. It's the 24 that people go to Venezuela. Okay, okay, here when you read the newspaper, coño es todo, todo. For example, when Cali is Pio Palestina, Cali go to Palestina, Cali go near in the border in Syria, this and Yemen. It's different the situation. Coño, pero Venezuela is in the core of the conflict around the world. Why? Why? Because has the more reservation petrol in the country, mm -hmm. uh, around the world. Yeah. You know, when you speak, that is the reason. Pero, pero when go one invasion to Venezuela, is the white people, is the black people, is the Latino people that go for die in the war. Similar to Vietnam, similar to Syria, similar to Iraq, similar to Iran. No, is that you want? I respect, pero no comparto. Respeto tu opinión como diplomático, pero no la comparto. Ok, ok, my brother, yo creo que ya esto terminó. <risa> Oye, te voy a dar mi tarjeta. Porque de todas maneras, no puedo venir. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you. We'll check in, brother. <risa> All right. Take care, man. All right, thank you for doing it, man. All right. All right.